before we begin the 23rd episode of the Jewish History Podcast, I'd like to share with you a few short messages. First of all, I want to thank you all for your listening and your attention. The first 22 episodes of the podcast, of the Jewish History Podcast, have been downloaded as of today more than 14,000 times. That's an astonishing figure, and I'm really humbled and honored that all you guys out there are listening uh, so consistently. And as a testament to the popularity of this podcast, we actually reached number one worldwide on the iTunes ranking under the category of Judaism. So that's amazing, and thank you so much, and thanks for taking the time out every week to listen. Uh, I have a few short requests. If you like the podcast, do me a favor, share it with a friend or friends, people that may be interested in this as well. Also, go to iTunes and subscribe if you have not yet done so. And please rate and review the podcast. It really helps us. Those ratings and reviews helps the podcast be found by other people. And of course, as always, if you have any questions or comments, do not hesitate to email me at rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Thanks and enjoy. Tonight's topic is another one of the great Jewish personalities, uh, a towering figure over the next era after the Gaonim, that's the era known as the Rishonim, and this is the greatest Ashkenazi Rishon, Rishon, and that, of course, is Rashi. And we spoke about a little bit last week uh, regarding the migration of the great Torah leaders and the beginning of the Ashkenazic and Sephardic Jewish communities. Last week we spoke about the four captives. Amongst the captives was Rav Chushil Gaon. He ended up in Morocco, and his son is the crossover figure known as Rabbeinu Hananel, and he was the one of the first of the Rishonim, uh, and at that cutoff point between the Gaonim and the Rishonim, and he wrote a, a revolutionary commentary on the entire Talmud. It was the first of its kind, and indeed all future commentaries, which are going to come really fast in the era of the Rishonim, are going to use Rabbeinu Hananel's commentary as the point of departure for their commentaries in the Talmud. And this is really emblematic of the era. Uh, There's going to be many, many commentaries written on the Talmud once the era of the Gaonim ends and the era of the Rishonim begins. Rabbeinu Hananel, he heads a large community with a big yeshiva in Tunisia. One of his students is one of the most influential and impactful Jewish leaders in history, Rabbi Yitzchak Al-Fasi, Rabbi Yitzchak from Fez, known by his acronym, the RIF. And he would end up moving to Spain and heading the huge Spanish Jewish community. The Hebrew word for Spain is Sfarad, i.e. the beginnings of the Sephardic Jewish community. Now the RIF is also going to be a personification of the role of the Rishonim because his magnum opus, his major work, a work that is published until this day in the back of every volume of Talmud, the book of Halachos, which is extracting the law out of the Talmud. We've spoken about in the past how the architects of the Talmud managed to insert into the vast corpus of the Talmud all the halacha, all the practical application of the law. But it's all buried in the give and take and the flow of the Talmud. So how do you, so the Riff, he was the first one to actually write a book that just is a digest of the Talmudic conclusions and just gives you the halacha. Before that, if you wanted to know the halacha, you'd either have to study the Talmud yourself and become an expert, or you would have to ask your gaon, your local gaon. But now you could just read the Riff and know the halacha. Now, he did something revolutionary, but he didn't really depart from the structure or the language of the Talmud. What he would do is he would take the snippet of a Talmud and that contains the halacha, and he would write that in his book. But this, again, we see is a change in the focus of the great rabbis, whereas the Gaonim did not write these kinds of books, comprehensive books of halacha or comprehensive books of commentary. On the Talmud, that now begins in earnest in the early eras of the Rishonim, uh, the Rif was the first, of course, to write down a book of halachas, a comprehensive book of halachas. It's now going to be a whole era of 500 years of doing that. And 
the riff's spiritual and halachic air, the Rambam, of course, is going to take this into a whole new stratosphere. The Rishonim marks an era of decentralization of Torah scholarship. During the times of the Gaonim, you had two Gaonim in Babylon. They were the address for any halachic or Talmudic query. And now that era is over. We no longer have two Gaonim that headline the leadership of the people. Jews are now spread out everywhere. Jews are now in Spain, in North Africa, uh, in Egypt, of course, in Israel, still a huge bastion in Babylon. And there's the rise of the Ashkenazic communities in Europe and the breakdown of the communications that is going to allow for the division on one hand between the Ashkenazic and Sephardic communities, but also an emphasis on explaining the Talmud, commenting on the actual flow of the Talmud, and additionally, standalone works of Talmudic halacha. So from the very beginning, the very earliest of the Rishonim, Rabbeinu Hananel, who is the son of one of the four captives, and his student, the Rif, both of them are of Sephardic origin, one of them writes a commentary on all Talmud, and one of them writes a book of halacha on the Talmud. Now both efforts are going to be very quickly eclipsed by their successors. The Rif moved to Spain, and he lived a very long life, and he died when he was around 100 years old. His student, Rabbi Yosef Ibn Megash, known as the Rimegash, was his successor. And the Rimegash had a student of his own uh, by the name of Rabbi Maimon, whose son, of course, is the Nesher Hagadol, the Great Eagle, the Muvchar Hamin Hanoshi, the choicest of the human species, uh, sometimes called the man of the millennium. Of course, Rabbi Moshe ben Maimon, Rabbi Moshe, the son of Maimon, known to us as the Rambam. The Rambam himself writes that he considers himself a disciple of the Rimagash, even though when the Rimagash died, the Rambam was only three years old. Now, the Rambam was very talented, but you don't imagine he would learn all the Torah before he turned three. But the idea being that the Rimagash taught his father everything he knew, who taught it to him. And thus we find a direct link from the greatest of the Sephardic Rishonim, the Rambam, back to the era of the Gaonim, the Rambam's father and his father's teacher, the Rimagash, to the Rif, to Rabbeinu Hananel, to Rabbeinu Chushil, who's one of the Gaonim. And he, of course, is going to take what the Rif began, a systematic, organized, codified work of halacha extracted from the Talmud, and going to take it to greater heights, an entirely different level. That's on the Sephardic side. The Ashkenazic community is also going to see its founding after the end of the Gaonic era. Rav Haidon, we spoke about him last week, he was the, one of the last, or the last of the Gaonim, and he had a student by the name of Rabbeinu Gershom Meor Hagola, sometimes called Meor Hagola, sometimes just called Rabbeinu Gershom. Meor Hagola, Hagola means the light of the exile. And he moved from Babylon to France, and he established a yeshiva there, and he is the first of the Rishonim in the Ashkenazic world. He's very famous because he made three edicts that became binding for the entire Ashkenazic Jewish community. Notably, he prohibited polygamy. Polygamy by the strict letter of the law is permitted, but he determined that it's no longer tenable for people to have more, for men to have more than one wife. And he said, from now on, for all Ashkenazi Jews who are under his sphere, his jurisdiction, his halachic jurisdiction, because he was the rabbi, the Moragol, the rabbi of all the Ashkenazi Jews, they can no longer have more than one wife. Should they desire to have more than one wife, they would need to get what's known as a heter mea rabbonim, a permission of a hundred rabbis. You have to have a hundred rabbis from three different countries to sign off on a, a a temporary allowance to marry more than one woman. Today it's a lot easier because there's a lot of communication between the various different countries. But a thousand years ago, to get a hundred rabbis to agree on anything, 
much less a uh, hundred rabbis over three different countries to agree on signing a waiver against this edict would be very difficult. Additionally, he prohibited unilateral divorce by the strict letter of the law. A man is the only one who has the responsibility to determine when it's time to sever ties between him and his wife. That's by Torah law. He declared, and it became binding for Ashkenazi Jews, that the wife must sign off as well. And lastly, in a totally different realm, he made a curse against anyone who reads someone else's mail. Now, these laws were accepted by those who were under his jurisdiction, i.e. the Ashkenazi Jews, but the Sephardic Jews, they did not accept it, and therefore, until recently, it was not terribly uncommon for for uh, a Sephardic man to have more than one wife. Now, he had a student, Rabbi Rabbeinu Gershom, who was known as Rabbi Yaakov ben Yakar, or the Re ben Yakar, whose student and the subject of tonight's discussion is Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, known to all as Rashi. So it's important to note, before we get on, the connection between the previous era and the current era. The Rambam traces it very easily back to the Gaonim, and Rashi's teacher's teacher made the, Rabbeinu Gershon made the trip, made the trip from Babylon to Israel. Rashi, of course, is going to go on to write the most comprehensive and exhaustive and acclaimed commentary in the Talmud, and he's going to take what Rabbeinu Hananel started, the idea of a great rabbi of a generation, to write a commentary, an exhaustive commentary in Talmud, and he's going to take it again to unseen heights. At this time, we see two emerging communities, the Ashkenazi community in Europe, primarily France and Germany, and the Sephardi community in North Africa, Spain, and the Middle East, and they are separated. Generally speaking, the Ashkenazim were under Christian rule. The Sephardim were under Islamic rule, and there was constant fighting, and that meant that efforts to reach out from one community to another community could be treated as espionage and the perpetrator would be executed by the authorities. So that created this uh, barrier between the Ashkenazic and the, and the Sephardic communities, and that's why, at this time, each community concurrently flourished and developed independently and almost unaware of each other, and as a result, all the developments, all the traditions and customs and edicts that were accepted in one community, were not accepted, maybe even weren't aware uh, of by the members of the other community. And therefore, at this time, we see this split, and that's why the customs, um, they diverge from each other at some, times, at some point. Now, for our discussion, it's clear that Rashi did not have access to Rabbeinu Hananel's commentary on the Talmud. It's one of the great what-ifs of history. What would have happened had Rashi had access to Rabbein Hananel? Maybe he would, he would have understood the Talmud and commented on it differently. And that also explains uh, why the Torah developments of that first hundred years of the Rishonim are somewhat different in the Ashkenazic and the Sephardic world. So let's talk about Rashi. Rashi He's the greatest of the Ashkenazic Rishonim, and the name Rashi is an acronym, either for Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, Rabbi Shlomo, the son of Yitzchak, or alternatively, people have suggested that Rashi may stand for Rabban Shel Yisrael, the rabbi of all of Israel. And that's an apt moniker and honorific for him because his impact and his importance on the Jewish people is impossible to fully capture, and there's almost no way to exaggerate. Uh, it's arguable to suggest that he had a greater influence on Torah scholarship and learning than any one individual in 2,000 years, maybe since Hillel, or who knows, maybe since Ezra, or going back even further. Uh, nowadays, it's impossible for us to fathom how people would study Talmud and study the Torah and Tanakh without Rashi. His own contemporaries have written 
that before Rashi came around, the Talmud was a sealed book. It was inaccessible. Maybe there were individuals studying it, people who are great intellects, or people that had a great tradition, or the great yeshiva students, but for the masses, it was inaccessible. Comes along Rashi, and he makes Jewish learning, Jewish study, especially study of the Talmud, accessible, and of course, the Torah as well. And this is ever more critical once the Jewish people are being decentralized. The central authority of the Geonim ends, no longer, people are more independent. People are, need, are going to need to learn Talmud much more independently. And therefore, Rashi arises to, to make it easy and accessible and user-friendly, make the Talmud easy and accessible and user-friendly for everyone. He was born in 1040 in Troyes in France. That's only two years after Rav Haidon died in 1038. His father, Rabbi Yitzchak, is a direct descendant of King David. And there are some really interesting legends surrounding his birth. His parents were childless for a long time. And his father, one of the stories tells that his father had a priceless gem. How he got this gem, the sources differ. Some suggest that he was a gem merchant and he had this really special uh, stone. Others Uh, tell the story that he had found the stone. Regardless, the local bishop wanted to buy it for him. Uh, They were willing to spend an exorbitant amount of money uh, to buy it. The problem was it would be used for idolatry. It would be used, some suggest, as an ornament for the church or as clothing for the bishop. Either way, Rabbi Yitzchak refuses to sell it. They corner him in the ship and they try to take it from him by force, and he pretends that it slips out of his hand, and he essentially throws it overboard, and he forfeits all uh, of that wealth. And at the time, a prophetic voice announced, Rabbi Yitzchak, you forfeited a brilliant gem for God's honor? You will merit to have a brilliant gem, a son who will illuminate the world with Torah. That's one legend. Another legend is that during his gestation, his mother was in Vermeisa, in Worms, in Germany, and she was walking in a narrow street. And two carriages, one from either direction, began barreling towards her in this really narrow street, threatening to crush her. And she pressed against the wall, and miraculously, a crevice formed in the wall to protect her from the danger. And there are accounts of communities who would look at that particular wall that had a crevice built in, and that was the wall where Rashi was uh, saved while still in utero. Now, not much is known about Rashi's early life. We know is that his father was his first teacher, uh, and as a teenager, he went to the center in Germany, where Rabbeinu Gershom had opened up his yeshiva. Now, some suggest that as a testament to his father's teaching, the very first comment on the Torah, the very first verse in the Torah, Rashi asks a very famous question. Why does the Torah start with the episode of Genesis? We know the Torah is a book of instructions. The word Torah means instructions. And we have a whole description of Genesis, and we have the whole story of Bereshis, and not many lessons, not many laws, not many Torah. So why does the Torah start there? It should start in the middle of Exodus, where it starts giving us the mitzvahs in rapid fire. And he says, Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak says, and he gives the famous answer that there will come a time where the non-Jews will question the Jewish people's right to the land of Israel. And they'll say, who's to say that you guys deserve it? And we'll show him Genesis. Look, the Amai created the whole world. And he chose to give Israel to us. There are those that have posited that this Rabbi Yitzchak that he quotes is in fact his father, who was his first teacher. And he memorialized that by quoting him at the beginning of his commentary on the Torah. Now he lives in a tense but somewhat safe and stable time to be a Jew in that particular part of the world. Towards the end of his life, we'll see... The first crusade begins when Rashi 
is 56 years old, and he's going to die in 1105. So the end of Rashi's life is marred by the vicious anti-Semitism and persecution of the Crusades. But for the duration, for the majority of his life, it's, it's, there's somewhat of a, a detente, of a, of a, of a quiet, of a, a calm before the storm for the Jews in Ashkenaz. And as a teenager, we, as we mentioned, Rashi went to the yeshiva of Rabbi Yaakov ben Yaakov, the student of Rabbi Gershom in Vermeiza in Worms in Germany. Now, he studied there for several years. When his teacher died, he continued studying for another year by a different teacher. And it's important for us to get a sense of what they were learning. Like how were they learning? Remember, the printing press, that wasn't developed until the 15th century. So there were no printed books. So how would people study? People would have to copy the books by hand. You get to the yeshiva, and they're learning a tractate of Talmud. Every student had to write by hand, make a copy for themselves of the entire tractate of Talmud. That was one notebook that they had. They also had another notebook uh, called a kuntris, where they would write the lecture notes and the comments and the expl- explanation of the text that they learned from their teachers. This other kuntris is where Rashi became very famous. And the way it was, the common practice was that every student would write his own kuntris, his own explanation of a particular volume of Talmud. And often, these students would trade them. They would sell to the, if they finish one track date and there's more junior students who are coming, they would give it to them and they would add their own notes. And eventually, they are these massive kuntresim that contain within it the compilation of all the students and all the insights and innovations and ideas uh, centralized in one large kuntres. When Rashi, as a student, he came and he had his own kuntres, his own notebook, and he took his notebook and he took the collected notebook of all the students that have studied there over the years and he organized them and he edited them and he merged them together to create the first version of his commentary on all of Talmud. This became wildly popular amongst the students of that yeshiva and students of all the yeshivas in the region. And it was copied very widely that from then on, from when Rashi was a young student, the word kuntris became associated with Rashi's commentary on the Talmud. And indeed, his contemporaries and those that came afterwards would reference him more frequently than not, as the Kuntris writes. Now, this was the first edition he's going to edit it several times. At the age of 25, Rashi moves back to Troyes, to France, and he's going to remain there for the rest of his life. He joins the Basin. And at the age of 30, he founded his own yeshiva in France that eventually became the premier yeshiva of all of Ashkenaz, and it supplanted the yeshiva's in Germany. Now, while studying and teaching to the students that flock to his yeshiva from all over the world, or from all over Ashkenaz, Rashi continually edited and re-edited and clarified and refined and sharpened and honed his kuntris. Eventually, he updates his first version with a second version, and ultimately, there's a third version that he does in all of Talmud, the most polished and the highly, most highly edited and most perfect version of his commentary. If you open up the Talmud today, what you're actually reading is the third version of Rashi's Kuntris of his notes on the Talmud. And there are some scholarly debates. People, scholars like to busy themselves with these things. Uh, for example, how widely disseminated was the final form? Is it possible that some editions of Rashi are not, are not the first, they're the first or the second or maybe even the third? Uh, for example, the book of Nidarim and Nazar, two, two volumes of Talmud, almost all the scholars agree that either it was written by Rashi, but it wasn't the last finalized, most crystallized and purified version of the Kuntris, or it was not written by Rashi at all. Uh, there are certain sections, notably the last 
uh, the last hundred and uh, fifty some odd pages of Baba Basra, that we don't have Rashi's commentary at all, and the last five pages of Makos. Uh, where those are, it's a great mystery. Were they lost in history? We know that the Crusades caused a lot of chaos in the region. Did Rashi not write in it? Uh, either way, those are some questions. But what was this commentary like? So I want to, just before we begin, to make uh, this abundantly clear. Rashi's commentary in the Talmud is absolutely indispensable if you want to study Talmud. To us, like we said, it's impossible to fathom what it's even like to try to venture into the sea of Talmud without Rashi. Rashi, of course, very quickly superseded all the other previous commentaries, Rabbi Gershom's commentary, Rabbi Hanal's commentary. He takes you sentence by sentence. You read a sentence of Talmud, you put the look at Rashi, and he's going to guide you along. Every statement, what's a statement? What's a question? Every answer, explaining all filling in all the gaps in the very terse style of the Talmud with characteristic brevity and a golden pen. Rashi conveys the give and take, the shaklavatari of the Talmud, and he smooths the way for us to try to venture into this world. An apt uh, evaluation of Rashi would say that Rashi spoon-feeds the Gemara to us, almost like today. Some people, it's hard for them to imagine to study Talmud without the art scroll, without the English. Maybe at the same time, it was equally as uh, as innovative and probably as controversial when Rashi came and said, I'm going to make it so easy for everyone. Uh, one of the things that he does is he helps us with the correct text. As we know, all the Talmuds have to be copied by hand. And therefore, everyone copied their own Talmud. So there's thousands of students all studying the Talmud, but they all have their own handwritten notes, and sometimes they differ from each other. So Rashi would say, Hachi Garcina, this is how we read. Loi Garcina, we don't read it like this very frequently. Uh, also, proper punctuation. Talmud does not contain punctuation. So what's the question and what's an answer? Sometimes you wouldn't know. For example, Rashi sometimes says one word, bitmia, which means... It's in a surprise. There's a question mark at the end here, uh, or even a terabang. Bini chusa, very frequently. Talmud says vehatanya, and we see in a brisa. So almost always, uh, this appears thousands of times in the Talmud. Almost always, when it says the word vehatanya, the Gemara is suggesting a question from a brisa that seems to conflict with whatever statement was just recently studied or just presented in the Talmud. But, somewhat infrequently, whenever it says vehata, when it says vehatanya, it can be understood not as a question, but as a supporting proof. And then you'll have one word Rashi, vehatanya binichusa. This is calm. This is not a question. This is a support. Also, the context. Rashi will tell you what's the question, where the question starts and ends. Sometimes a, que- a statement is interjected with a question before the statement can even be finished. And if you don't have Rashi, you wouldn't even know. How would you navigate through the Talmud if you didn't know what's a question, what's an answer? And sometimes there's a statement, in the middle of the statement, there's an interjection of a question, and Rashi breaks it all down for you really nicely. Also, uncommon words. The Talmud is written in Aramaic. The majority of nouns are Hebrew. But occasionally, primarily during Agadic sections of the Talmud, you'll have a word that's very infrequently used. Rashi will tell you everywhere else that appears, and often will translate it for you into the local lingua franca, the language of the time, and that, of course, is Old French. You would say, this is what it means, bilaaz. And I think maybe one of the most remarkable hallmarks of Rashi's commentaries is that it scales. You have young children who study Talmud, study the Torah, and Brashi is their guide. And then you have seasoned scholars who've spent 70 years studying Talmud or studying Torah, and they are challenged by his words as well. In every book of the Talmud, almost every book of the Talmud published, Rashi's commentary will be found in the inner margins of the Talmud. Again, as we mentioned, if not for Rashi, the Talmud would be a sealed book. Now, Rashi took 
a similar approach in his commentary on Tanakh. We know the Torah, the Torah can be understood on many levels. Rashi's objective in his commentary on the Torah is to help us study. Just like the Talmud was a sealed book without Rashi, the Torah was very difficult to understand without Rashi as well. And his goal, his stated objective, is to convey the simplest understanding of the text. In the book of Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, famously, the verse tells us that Adam and Eve heard the voice of Hashem Elohim in the garden, and they hide. So Rashi says, Yesh Midrashe Agada Rabim. There's many Midrashic interpretations. And it was already organized and codified and delineated in the Midrash and all the other, the great Midrash and the, all the other Midrashim. I only came, my stated objective is only to explain the simple understanding of the text. And Ula Agada Hamiyashevet Divrei Hamikra, and to Agadic interpretations that make the words of the text easily understood. Rashi, when there's multiple midrash, midrashic interpretations on a verse, he will always stick to the one that is most closely associated with what he interprets as the simplest understanding of the text. Now, what's the, what methodology did he use? I think I think a way to understand this is that any comment that Rashi has, Rashi has, like we said, Rashi is trying to give us the understanding of the text. Any comment that Rashi has, it's obviously because the simple reading of the text is difficult. Now, Rashi and thus he's commenting, he's explaining to you how to learn. Obviously, Rashi is insinuating that if he did not, uh, that, he, that if he did not explain what it meant, it would be not understood. Now, surprisingly, Rashi doesn't tell us his question. He just gives us the answer. So, for example, Rashi could be trying to understand why a particular word appears, why there's an extra word in the verse, why an uncommon word, Rashi knew all of Tanakh by heart, and he would tell you every time the word is mentioned. Uh, very frequently, Rashi is going to explain the grammar. The grammar he finds problematic. And, and uh, another common example is chronology. Uh, we know the Parsha that we're reading this week and this past week, Teruma and Tetzava and half of Tisisa, they actually happen after the events of Kisisa. So Rashi in Exodus, in Shemos, chapter 31, verse 18, tells us that all these things happened afterwards, but the Torah is, the Torah is not necessarily written in chronological order, and therefore, uh, the to- and therefore, for whatever reason, the Torah decided to go off the, the, the linear uh, chronological order. There's actually a book, a series of books, five books written, called What's Bothering Rashi. And what it does is it deconstructs every Rashi in the Torah and says, okay, Rashi is saying this, obviously something was bothering him, what was bothering Rashi. And Rashi managed to convey ideas, nuances, questions, and answers using very minimal words. I, one of my favorite examples is in the story of Exodus, uh, by the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, so we know what happened at midnight. And the verse tells us that Pharaoh got up. And Rashi says one word, Mimitaso, from his bed. And it was always surprising, like what is Rashi adding? Like what, what lesson is being conveyed? And if you think about it, Rashi is invoking the fact that Pharaoh was asleep. Even though Moshe had told him that at midnight all the firstborn were going to die, Pharaoh got up from his bed, and that shows us that Pharaoh did not take to heart, despite Moshe's proven track record, he didn't take to heart his prediction of doom for Egypt and was comfortable enough to go to sleep. That's a one-word Rashi. Rashi doesn't say, well, that Rashi doesn't spell it out for us. And that makes it, the study of it, such an absolute joy. Also, as a testament to Rashi's piety and humility, he was unafraid 
to admit when he doesn't know something. So for example, in Genesis and Bratius, chapter 28, when Jacob is fleeing from his brother who wants to kill him, it says, Vayishlach Yitzchak et Yaakov, Yitzchak sent Jacob, Vayelech Paden Aram, he went to Paden Aram, El Lavan to Lavan, Ben Besuha Arami, Achi Rivka, the brother of Rivka, Aim Yaakov and Esav, the mother of Yaakov and Esav. Rashi says, four words, Eini Yodeya Ma Malamdeinu. I don't know what this teaches us. We know already that Rivka was the mother of Jacob and Esau of Yaakov and Esau, and Rashi in fulfilling of the Talmudic instruction of the book of Brachos, page 4a, where the Gemara says, Lamed l'shoncha, teach your tongue, train your tongue to say, Eini Odea. Rashi says, I don't know what the lesson is. I'm sure Rashi was clever enough to conjure some lesson of why it says that Rebecca was the mother of Yaakov and Esau, but I think he teaches an even more powerful lesson by telling us, telling us, I don't know what the lesson is. Now, Rashi's commentary on the Torah spawned numerous super commentaries, hundreds, certainly, perhaps even thousands. Most famously, the Ramban, Nachmanides commentary on the Torah, is actually a commentary on Rashi and the Gur Arya of the Maharal, the Re'em, amongst others. In 1475, 35 years after uh, the Gutenberg invention, we have the first Hebrew book is actually Rashi's commentary to the Torah. Now, the era of Ashkenazic peace and stability will be very short. In the end of Rashi's life, in 1095, Pope Urban II called on all Christians to march in Jerusalem and liberate it from the Muslims, which they ended up doing successfully. And along the way, they massacred and pillaged Jewish communities. They did, performed mass forced baptisms. And the behavior of persecution and anti-Semitism that will be endemic to the Christian treatment of the Jews for the better part of the thousand years was uh, reaching a fever pitch and was being developed. They marched on to Jerusalem, and they took all the Jews of Jerusalem, somewhere between 900 and 3,000 people. They gathered them into the main synagogues, burnt the whole place down, destroyed the whole Jewish population of Jerusalem. All told, over the several-year trek from various parts of Europe to Israel, the numbers are somewhere between 10,000 and as high as 25,000 Jews are slaughtered. And this marks also a a turning point. From then on, there's going to be a lot of hostility from the Christian Europe to the Jews. They're going to suffer a lot, and it's going to affect the Jews very severely. Now, Rashi himself and his community were spared, even though many of Rashi's relatives were killed. And there's a famous legend between Rashi and Godfrey of Bullion, who was one of the leaders of the crusade on to Jerusalem. Now, Rashi was a very famous wise man and holy man, not just for the Jews, but for the non-Jews. So Godfrey comes to Rashi on his way to Jerusalem, and he asks for a blessing, or he asks for also a prediction, what's going to be with this, uh, this undertaking? So he goes to Rashi, and he asks him, what's going to be? What, what, what about my plan? And Rashi says, you'll conquer Jerusalem, but you won't rule over Jerusalem for that long. And the Muslims will come and fight you back, and you'll flee, and you'll return to Twa with only three horses. And the story goes that he went to Jerusalem, managed to capture Jerusalem. They weren't there for so long. He was named king of Jerusalem. Eventually, he had to flee and leave. And he gets to Twa, and he actually has four horsemen with four horses. And he says, ah, Rashi was wrong, and I'm going to come slaughter them all. And as they're entering the city, a stone gets dislodged from, uh, from the wall of the, uh, of the city, and it strikes and hits one of the horses, and indeed he arrives to Twa with only three horsemen. Uh, some have suggested that the resurgence of interest 
of the Christians and I guess the Muslims as well in the Holy Land is what spurred Rashi to make sure that his very first comment of the, on the Torah includes a statement of our rights to Israel. The Muslims say they, they own Israel and the Christians come along say they own Israel and the truth is that God gave it to us. Now, in addition to these monumental magisterial commentaries on the Talmud and the Torah, Rashi also published his own sitter. He wrote many salichos that we still have today. He sent out hundreds of responses that are still extant. But most notably, he founded the yeshiva, which became known as the House of Rashi, the great yeshiva of the Bali Tosafos, the French and German school comprised of Rashi's descendants. Rashi had three daughters. All of his daughters were known for their scholarship and their piety. There's this myth that Rashi's daughters wore tefillin. It's not true. There's no source for it. But what is for sure true is that they each married fantastic Torah scholars. So his daughter Yocheved married uh, Rashi's student, Rabbi Meir ben Shmuel. They had four sons and a daughter together. And these four sons are all members of the Tosafos, the additions. It's the additions to Rashi's commentary. Rabbi Shmuel ben Meir, the Rashbam, the Rashbam is Rashi's grandson. He was actually the one who completed Rashi's commentary from page 28a in Baba Basra until the end. He also wrote his own commentary on the Torah. He actually writes that he's not happy with his grandfather. His grandfather came and professed to always be looking for the simplest understanding of the verse. He didn't do a good enough job. I'm going to do a better job. Rabbi Yakro was another one of, of Rashi's grandchildren, and he's known, of course, by his title, Rabbeinu Tam, Yakrov Ish Tam, and therefore they called him uh, Rabbeinu Tam. Rabbi Yitzhak, known as the Rivam, his other daughter Miriam married Rabbi Yudah Barnas and the Rivan, who completed his commentary on Makros. Rashi's third daughter, Rachel, married another student of Rashi, And these sons-in-law and grandchildren, they continued the leadership of the institution that Rashi founded, and they wrote a revolutionary commentary, like we mentioned, called the Tosafos, or the additions, additions to Rashi's Kuntras. What's really interesting about their commentary is that they managed to get a hold of the Sephardic teachings that Rashi did not have access to, Notably, the works of Rabbeinu Hananel. And after 150 years of separation, there is a brief period of collusion and of intercourse between the, the Ashkenazic and the Sephardic communities. And that's really on display in the Tosafos with there. It's a commentary that's going to compare and contrast the Ashkenazic and the Sephardic traditions of understanding the Talmud. Additionally, the Tosafos, they, uh, unlike Rashi, who would stick to the page, try to hold your hand and walk you through the sea of the Talmud, the Tosafos would always look at the big picture. They would zoom out and say, okay, what are the underlying ideas? Let's try to extract the core concept of the Talmudic session and let's contrast it with every other place all over the Talmud that has a slightly different idea. And it's always, it's very fascinating because they're very different works, but they're always at odds with each other. And that's why, even though they were his grandchildren and his successors, the Tosafos did not hesitate to argue with their grandfather, with Rashi. What resulted from the Tosafos is a towering commentary on all the Talmud with astonishingly profound depth and scope. A a fitting tribute to Rashi is found in the words of his son-in-law in in Makros 19, where his commentary ends. The Talmud there is discussing various instances where someone consumes Meiser Shani in a state of purity or impurity and in Jerusalem and out of Jerusalem. And the last words that Rashi says, or among the last words that Rashi writes, is the word tahor, pure. And the tribute reads, Rabbeinu, our teacher, gufo tahor, his body was pure, v'yatsanish matobet tahara, and his 
soul emerged with purity. Lo piresho teri did not comment any further. Mikan ve'elach, from here on out, for the next five pages of Makros, Lashon Talmido, Rabbi Yehuda bar Nassan. This is the words of his student, Rabbi Yehuda bar Nassan. The author of that tribute is echoing the eulogy given to Rabbi Eliezer in the book of Sanhedrin. Rabbi Eliezer died, he also died amidst Torah study, and he was in the middle of answering a question about the purity or impurity of a given matter. And he said, Tahar, it's pure. And immediately he died. And all the onlookers claimed, Yatsanish Matoba Tahara, his, his soul left with purity. Rashi was given the same eulogy by his son-in-law. Rashi died in 1105, but I would argue that Rashi lives on on the pages of Talmud, and every Chumash, every student of Torah, every student of Talmud, is guided by the words of Rashi. The study of Torah worldwide is a living legacy to this most paramount and greatest of teachers of Torah.